I think that there's, there's a lot to learn and it's very important in tumour biology and in other cancers we know that it's important, ovarian, breast and so on. Um, so coming to where we are in, in uh, um, urology, well, I think there's a gathering body of evidence to show that uh, it, it is important. And there's a lot that we don't quite understand about how it's working. So if we take patients who've got um, homologous recombinant repair or HRR mutation status, in other words, if your tumor is mutated, uh, then we know that um, a PARP inhibitor and Alaparib was the first one to be tested through uh, the studies from Johan de Bono's group, which has culminated in uh, um, the TOPOP trial and so on, that there is a response. But what has become interesting um, is that in combination studies uh, with Alaparib, and it is Alaparib, uh, Valiparib has also been tried, uh, but uh, Alaparib in combination with Abiraterone seems to work independent of HRR mutation status. There is certainly a signal. Um, and I was lucky enough to be part of a multi-centre team that looked at this uh, combination of patients in castrate resistant disease. Um, these were patients who were heavily pretreated. Uh, the, the majority had had dostaxel. They were late in their uh, cancer journey. Um, and they were given the combination in a, 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 a quite large phase two study, 142 patients randomized to abiraterone and elaparib versus uh, abiraterone alone. And that's Abby with PRED, obviously. Yeah. And so the unique design of that trial was that all the patients were given it irrespective of HRR mutational status but they were all tested, either with tissue or with plasma uh, or, and with uh, somatic, um, sorry, with uh, germline mutation status. And uh, overall, about 15% of the patients had some form of alteration of AR, HRR mutation. But what was found in the results, and this was published this year in uh, Lancet Oncology, uh, is that the combination seemed to work irrespective of HRR mutation status, which was quite a surprise. Mm -hmm. And I think that opens up the field because, as Nick has mentioned, that actually getting tissue from patients is difficult and doing HRR mutation status for somatic mutations on tissue actually fails in about half of the patients. Um, and so uh, it, it does raise the question of whether this will um, create a new kind of niche uh, whereby we can use combination therapies uh, in patients who are uh, castrate resistant. I think the other thing here is tumour heterogeneity, isn't it? So if you look at patients where you've got germline status and the tumour status, they're not always matching each other. So you'll have patients, uh, and um, the, we know that tumor, obviously a tumour that's metastasized to the liver and metastasized to the bone, those tumours are going to be different from each other. Yeah. And um, so I think one of the better ways potentially to look for these mutations is not to, to biopsy people, because particularly biopsying bone is a sort of Black & Decker general anaesthetic job. And then you've got this quite challenging processing issues with decalcification and all the rest of it as well, getting tumour cells out, but looking at circulating tumour DNA, because that way you get a sort of aggregate snapshot of the entire tumour burden. Um, and also then you've got a potential monitoring tool as well. So we know late on, in, as these things are inevitably going to be trialled first, you've got quite often got substantial tumor, circulating tumour DNA levels, and that can be used both for diagnosis and monitoring. Because I think the thing about the, the biopsies is you've got a biopsy that's just one sample. You don't know that you're, you, the reason you got a response was because all the critical drivers were elsewhere and had the mutation. You, you simply don't know. Whereas if you, you might get a, a, a view of that if you had the circulating tumour DNA. Well, I, I couldn't agree more, Nick, and I think there's a huge amount of naivety in the cancer community about yeah. what is achievable on a single biopsy. Uh, we've just published a paper in European Urology whereby we took uh, radical prostatectomies from 10 patients. We had MR scanned them, we then took the prostate fresh, sliced it, multiply sampled it, and we did intensive genomic testing on each tumour. What we found was that, firstly, the genomic classifiers didn't really stand up, we found that we could take a, a tumour core biopsy from the same tumour in the prostate and do differential genomic analysis on those two adjacent cores and get a different result. Uh, so I am very sceptical that this approach of biopsying a metastasis and then treating is going to yield anything. Uh, uh, it will help us understand the biology, 
I think it will not help us in the clinic, yeah. actually. I think if you're picking up something that's kind of like on the stem of the, the, uh, the branching tree that leads down to all the different lesions you've got, then maybe it might, you know, you, yep. it doesn't matter where you biopsy. But, if it, but I think for a lot of these targeted therapeutics where you have to have quite a specific thing, I, I, I'm very sceptical that that is much of an approach, really. Yeah. Um, the, it's, it's, yeah. It sounds precision, but it's not yeah, really it's precision because no, you, you, no. you may be missing a totally different part of the tumour. I think it's yeah. a gross oversimplification. I think that's right. That's the biological complexity yeah. of cancers.